So, hi, Paolo, welcome to this Zoom interview. Hi, thank you. You wrote this great essay, pamphlet, I don't know how to call it. How, what, what term do you use yourself, pamphlet or essay? I don't know either, but I use, yeah, short essay seems quite a right. Short, a short essay, that's a quite good term. Um, Paolo Giordano, in Tide from the Schmetting, uh, How Contagion Works. What's the Italian title? Nel Contagio. Nel Contagio. Beautiful. Um, before we go, before we start with um, with a conversation about the essay, I just I'm wondering, you you look like you're in your study. Are you in, in what uh, town are you? Where are you? I'm in Rome, where I live, and I haven't moved, of course, since uh, mid February now, which is very unusual for me because I uh, I tend to escape. Uh, a lot and I tend to travel a lot and this is probably the longest time I've spent in a, in the same place in the last 10 years so and, and at home of course but that's common to most of us and are you uh, alone or with a family I'm with the family we and it was fine i mean if someone had told me uh, before well you you're going to stay locked down for uh two months in the same house with the family uh, no chance of going out um uh, i would have said that would be impossible but it turns out that we are way more adaptive than we think and it actually was pretty fine i have that same experience and oh, uh, sometimes i'm even a bit ashamed for it because i'm having such a cozy nice time with my wife and kids at home you recognize that <laughs> uh yeah well maybe that would be a little too much <laughs> but <laughs> we i mean I managed, we managed, I think everybody did. I mean, our kids are not that uh, small, so they're grown ups. Uh, each of them has its own life and they had their uh, online lessons. Uh, the, the, the... Hi, hi, sorry, sorry hi. to interrupt. Um, Sandra, we're not able to hear you very well. Um... Shall I shout louder? <laughs> I think no, you I stay think... with me. I think because I'll, the, I'll the do something plugs. with the headphones. I'll try okay, to. Okay, great. Put off this Sorry, I didn't one. want to interrupt, but we weren't able to hear, be able to hear everyone right. You hear me good now. Yes, that's better. Perfect. Yes. All right. All right. Great. Right. Thanks. Thanks. I'll, Let's go on. I'll be Thank gone you. again. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> so Megan gave me the chance to move away from the personal stuff, <laughs> which always embarrasses me a lot. Okay, okay. I, I, I do have, I do have one rather Dutch question. Did you buy a bike? Not yet, but uh, our government just said that uh, there will be um, how do you say helps and for people who want to buy bikes because they want to invest on uh, green moving way of moving and of course uh, try to um, put less people on the public transport for obvious reason of the pandemic and so that's my plan i'm actually planning to buy two bikes uh, at the same time for the family okay okay i uh, maybe my uh, secretary um, of uh, uh, state of finances uh, uh, for him i have to ask probably uh, not not too much too expensive bikes i hope no no because we don't want to spend too much dutch money <laughs> <laughs> for our bikes probably yes so we'll okay. be yeah we'll be humble let's let's talk about um uh the virus the measures the um uh, europe uh, a little bit later and first introduce you a little bit to our uh, audience 
um, you uh, got uh, you became an instant uh, famous writer with your debut novel, uh, The Solitude of Solitude of Prime Numbers. I think it was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I remember you coming here, uh, coming over to uh, Holland, and uh, as a very young uh, writer being interviewed uh, and admired because that book was absolutely great and marvelous. Um, you won the most important uh, uh, literary prize in uh, Italy for it, the Premio Strega, if I pronounce this correctly. Perfectly. Thank you. Um, where did you come from? You, were, you came from a, a background of science, I think. Yes. How, how did I, you come up being a writer? Well, when I wrote that first book, I was uh, in between my degree in physics and the start of my PhD program. And so everything happened then in the, in the next three years. So I managed to finish my, to get my PhD. Uh, but then I had to leave physics or research, let's say, uh, to, to become a full-time writer. But, uh, you know, that, that's a question that's been with me from the very beginning. I, I remember that it felt very, that people were very curious about this idea of a physicist who, uh, who wanted to be a writer at the same time. But to me, that's always been, I mean, the question has always been uh, stranger than the answer because I, I've never really experienced any um, separation between the two things. I mean, we do a lot of things in our lives. We can be uh, musicians and accountants, and we can be uh, writers and physicists. And sometimes our passions become our job. Sometimes they don't, but that's what happened to me. And I'm still trying to keep the food the two things together and in the light of what we're experiencing today with this uh, epidemic i don't know how it is in, in 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 the netherlands but here in italy we've never seen so many scientists on television and we've never heard we've never listened so much to scientists talking and and uh, sometimes this revealed the enormous need for um, uh, for communicating science that we have, because there is a, a gap that is too big between the common understanding of science and what we need to understand. So uh, I think I somehow fit in that space in between, not because I'm smart, but just because of what I've studied before. And so I'm trying more and more to bring the two things uh, closer and closer because I feel it's necessary. You are actually uh, writing about this in the essay and uh, you're saying, you're, you're, you're writing about um, the fact that science now disappoints us because all these pundits that are on television, they, they, don't, they don't know either. And I, I, I don't think you're very optimistic in, in the essay, but I took a little bit out, uh, out of the way we are treating pundits now and, and the, the scientists. I'm taking a little bit with me that the public, we, I, we acknowledge that science is not almighty and that even then, even while it's not almighty, we can still learn the best at this moment from science. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we, we get disappointed because scientists, maybe they disagree on some points because they have different versions of the same thing. Yeah. Or uh, we get disappointed because they simply say, we don't know this. We don't know this yet. We need more time. We need more 
study, we need experiments and they have to be uh, done in a certain way, in a precise and uh, reliable way. So uh, it's a very weird existential condition for all of us, I think, because science doesn't live off truth. It mostly lives on doubts and questions, questions rather than answers. But that's exactly the opposite that we've been of what we've been uh, used to uh, in the last years. No, we we've been we've become more and more used to answers, very simple answers, statements from politicians, even when they didn't know, have an idea of what they were talking about, they were still giving answers, um, tweets. Facebook polls, so very concise uh, uh, statements on very complex program, pl problems. And uh, suddenly, science brings this complexity back and it says, we don't know. Uh, I think it's a very strong political statement in a way, and, and that we should all somehow learn from this and 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 become more demanding from now on of the things that we ask and the answers that we get i mean it's it's better i think to to have someone say we don't know than give a random answer uh just yes yes and you I, I, i'm i was thinking that maybe we have become a little bit more resilient and 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 uh, used getting used to uh uncertainty and li learning to live with uncertainty um we are now going to the essay itself um the the, the, the part that struck me the most was in Holland. It was very well done by the uh, publishing house, the Bezige Bij. They put it on front of the, uh, the essay. And it, it was very, two very strong sentences. It, I'm, I'm going to read them. It's, you say, you're writing, I'm afraid of everything that the contagion can change, of discovering that the structure holding up civilization as I know it is nothing but a house of cards. I'm afraid of annihilation, but also of its opposite, that fear will eventually pass without leaving any trace of change behind. Well, you wrote this three months ago, two months ago, two and a half months ago. How is it with your fear that this will pass without leaving any trace of change behind? Ah. I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's. We, we can also ask this. I can ask no. this question in, in 20 minutes again. Yes. Yes. And, and in two months again. No, okay. I think no. I think we should go there now. Uh, well, there, again, I don't know how it is in the Netherlands, probably because you went through a much milder experience somehow than here but here there is a lot of talk about change uh change that uh, will happen within ourselves and in society and uh, in politics uh, i don't think changes happen by themselves and especially I mean, changes for the good, which is what most people mostly refer to. Uh, I think it's rather the opposite. I mean, after a, a very deep crisis and a tragedy like this, it's much more likely that uh, changes for the worse happen. So I'm trying to fight against this attitude of just taking the change for something that happens on itself i mean this is the time in which we should be discussing things about this transformation and this transition because there is going to be a transition 
and it's going to be uh, as severe as the crisis, uh, the more severe the longer the crisis is. Um, but the direction it takes really depends on the level of the discussion that we're doing now and on the things that we're focusing on now and um, so um, we need to be a little more proactive i think in in this moment rather than just waiting for something to happen okay well about the proactivity you uh started with um uh writing this essay uh, I just have to mention that before that you, uh, before you wrote the essay, in the books between your debut novel, uh, which was actually a love story, uh, and this essay, you wrote other books. And for these books, you traveled to Congo, uh, I think I remember Pakistan or Afghanistan, and um, so you were very socially involved. You went to the places where the big atrocities happened. Um, so, I, to me, it looks like you, I, I consider this part of your uh, authorship, the way you're, the way you're writing. Um, in this case, it also looks like you thought at one particular moment, now I need to write, now I have to do something, the world, this is happening in the world and let me get involved. Do you remember about when the day that do you remember the day that that happened that you thought now it's not yes uh, i mean it's very still very the timeline of this is still very clear to me i was uh, quite on alert uh, about the situation since january when the the epidemic was still apparently happening only in china uh probably because i had been reading in the in the previous years about uh, sars and about mass and about other uh, epidemics that eventually didn't turn out to be pandemics but that could have happened like that so uh, i was aware of the danger and so i was looking at things very carefully but then uh, there was like uh a zero moment in Italy, which was, I would say, February 21st, when um, the first Italian cases were found up north in Lombardy. And it was immediately very clear that the situation was rather uh, severe. And it was a week and it was a Saturday. And on Monday, I think it was Monday, I wrote the first article for uh, yeah, Corriere della Sera, which is a, uh, an important Italian newspaper. And in that article, I tried to explain how mathematically, very simply, of course, but how mathematically an epidemic works. And I did it because the the epidemic was at that point only visible in the numbers. It was a sort of projection that you had to do in a couple of weeks time. It was abstract. Um, and, and then a, a week after that, the, the numbers kept rising and rising day by day and they rose and they were rising in a way that is very natural for an epidemic so like an exponential in an exponential way but that feels very unnatural for people to look at because it feels like something that is completely out of control and and so again i thought that this needed to be explained to people because otherwise fear could simply be under uh, out of control itself and expectations could be very wrong so and that was the moment in which i started to write the book and the book I, I knew the book could only could also be a way to talk about these things out of italy Th there was another thing that was very clear at that point but it wasn't clear to all the people that 
this thing had happened so far in China and, and was happening in Italy. So everybody was talking about an Italian situation, but that was partly an illusion. There's never really been an Italian situation because this pandemic happens everywhere. It can start everywhere at any time. And we know what happened afterwards. Italy was just advanced with respect to other countries. So a book could be uh, a more, more effective way to reach also uh, a different audience, I think. And what was for you, 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 you started with the day zero. You, you, what was for you the exact moment that you decided, I'm going to write that book? Uh, it was, I mean, I started the book on February 29, and I think I decided it two days before. Uh, and I, I mean, I had to check the, uh, the possibility of making, because there were quite many uh, constraints uh, around me. It was very clear at that point that Italy would soon be in a form of lockdown. We didn't know what kind of lockdown, but it was very likely that publishers um, would have be in trouble uh, producing, actually producing new books. Mm -hmm. So the, the time was very limited. I knew I had no more than a week to finish it and edit it and send it to the publisher and have it printed. And, and what, what I found very comforting was that all the people who were involved in this very small enterprise immediately understood the feeling of this, the motivation. Even my, my Dutch publisher, uh, the Basie B, uh, they immediately understood that it was something that needed to, do, to be done fast and uh, without taking into account all the usual paradigms of publishing, which are very slow and heavy mm -hmm. normally, no? And, and I think that's a common thing that happened to many of us. We all had to reinvent and reshuffle our usual way of doing things and find new and maybe most more effective ways to get them done in a situation like this. Yes, okay. The, um, uh, of course, in, in Italy, in the northern part of it, in Lombardy, it started. And uh, in Italy, I remember the images of, I don't know which city, I think it was Bergamo, where you saw yeah. big trucks of the army with the deaths driving away at night. Um, in other uh, European countries, uh, at first, you did not see a lot of um, the victims. Even now, victims, you see, you see, I see rooms, but you don't see the people, like you would see people in an earthquake or in a war with blood on them. Um, still, it's, a, it's such a strange thing that, that the illness is so invisible. Do you think that that has something to do with um, why we were so bad at taking it serious soon enough? Well, uh, there's, it's, everything that is happening is happening in, an, in, in a very unusual way. And even dying in a situation like this happens in a very unusual way. Uh, you know, most of those people whose coffins we saw uh, taken out of um, of the hospitals, uh, they couldn't even have a proper funeral. Um, those who could have a funeral uh, maybe could have one or two people attending. And I know directly of people who had to um, film the ceremony uh, and so that, that the other relatives could see it via WhatsApp. Uh, so it's, it's a completely new setting. And many, many deaths happen in, um, how do you call them in English? Uh, uh, 
care facilities, care houses. Yeah, care houses. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody was allowed to go in and out, of course, because of the pandemics. That was too risky, both for the people who were entering and for the people who were inside. So uh, the, the, the health uh, uh, people were the only one who could be present uh, with, those, with those dying people. So, yeah, as you say, many things happened uh, and they were completely invisible to our eyes, uh, which made, I think, things much worse for those who were involved into it. And many people were in their houses alone, um, maybe having trouble breathing. Uh, So I think it will take a lot of time before we actually uh, realize and investigate everything that happened to people. Because at the same time, a very new emergency was taking place. There were so many new things to to take into, so many things to do. We had to shut down uh, everything, shops, uh, stay in our houses. Everybody was afraid. So somehow even the deaths were just numbers, were basically numbers in the hundreds. I mean, we're still above 100 today and we're saying, oh, things are getting much better. We still have more than 100 deaths per day, uh, which is a very, uh, I mean, controversial way of saying that things are going better. But Mm -hmm. still we're forced to look at things in, in a, yeah, again, in a complete different way, which to some extent almost feel inhuman. Why do you say inhuman? Uh, I mean, very cruel. Okay. Um, the, it's also very difficult to explain to someone who has a little shop or a little business and uh, is losing his uh, business is, 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 and doesn't earn anything anymore. It's also more difficult to tell him or her Uh, to stay inside and don't sell anything or don't work anymore and go bankrupt while nothing is visible it shouldn't there be um, like a big ceremonies where every week we mourn the dead shouldn't we put uh, on the newspapers every day uh, uh, portraits of the dead shouldn't we make everything way more visible to constantly understand what's happening for everybody that also has to give up a lot of their freedom. I think this is a this is a very different perception uh, that you're having in the Netherlands compared to the one we're having here. Uh, I I really wouldn't say that people haven't become aware of what was happening. Uh, and I mean, even owners of shops and uh, manufacturers and and all that who are losing money and risking uh, their lives in other ways, I think all of them were very aware at some point that this was something that needed to be done. Um, I mean, the those images that you were mentioning before uh, and more images that that we saw i mean they felt very close to us they felt very close because i mean uh, bergamo is not it's not in another country probably it's just it's just a place that I mean, it's the place that i know it's all, all think, those places I think you are from the north of Italy, aren't you? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm from the north, but uh, it's, it's. Uh, I mean, they felt like something very close, and I think the the real problem here is that they didn't feel as close uh, to people 
uh, to non-Italians. Uh, and that was something that I thought should have happened, at least within the European Union. Um, but but yes. for I some reason it didn't. I have a question about that, but before I want to have one question uh, 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 as an extension of the last question. Here in Holland, uh, it's maybe maybe a little bit more difficult to convince people uh, to take strict measures because uh, the deaths are less visible than in Italy. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, the idea of asking every 70 plus person to stay at home and letting the younger ones go to work. What do you think about that? Well, it's something that's been somehow not take, not really taken into consideration here uh, so far. I think, uh, I mean, this virus is not treating, it, it is infecting the whole population, but it's not treating all the population in the same way. Uh, if you look at the, simply look at the statistics, which are now wide enough, uh, the, the difference between the risk for elderly people compared to young people is very, very uh, strong. Uh, on the one side, on the other side, though, we also have to remember that there are vulnerable people uh, also among the among the younger people who have other pathologies people who have other pathologies and maybe they don't even know about it so uh, the the age distinction is only one of the distinctions that can be done uh, it was a little uh, it, it's it's You're very struggling with this question it's, it's yes, it's, it's, because it's, I have mixed feelings. I have very yes. mixed feelings about it. I have, I honestly haven't make, made up my mind uh, very precisely about it. I think in the end, some distinction will, uh, will prevail. So uh, elderly people will, when, when we go out again, really, uh, people who are more vulnerable will have to be more careful. That's, I, I think that's unavoidable. I don't know if it's something that should be put as a measure from, let's say, from the top. It, uh, I, also because our society in that way, probably the Italian one, even more than the, than the Dutch one, is, is very inter, interlaced with, between the different ages so it's very difficult and again very cruel to cut out a part of, of the population and once you have uh, young people going out they they're going to visit the grandparents and so you 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 would need to stop that as well so it would be a sort of apartheid very strong or part of a, of, a, of the population so that's why i cannot really give you a very okay okay strong because, answer yeah we have put in the, the 70 plus uh, in homes already and you keep them at home um <laughs> the can, it's interesting that here the 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 it, it it's it sounds like it's not uh, not a scientific question anymore that i ask but more a political issue what do you think about the choose about what choosing a measure like uh, uh, telling everybody to go outside and work and uh, keeping every seventy plus year old inside? Is that a political question or a scientific question? Well, in a moment like this, every scientific evidence becomes uh, political somehow. So, yeah. um, and I think one of the things that I've been critical about 
was that I I often saw uh, politicians hiding themselves a little bit behind the scientists and the science when there were very complicated uh, things to to decide. Uh, the, the, the sentence that was recurring was, well, we need to ask the scientists first. The scientists will decide and, and so forth. But the scientists don't have to decide. They don't get to decide. The scientists can answer precise questions if they uh, are asked uh, precise answers on their specific field. And so a scientist would probably uh, underline the fact that this virus is not totally democratic, but it kills a part of the population more easily than another part. So that's the, that's the answer that scientists gives. From that point on, it completely becomes political. So what, because it boils down to the relationship that we have between different generations, uh, that, I mean, we can see this about the 70-year-old people, but there is a, a, a symmetric aspect in the very young people who are, uh, at least here, mostly cut out of the, um, of the public discussion. So schools were shut down, and that was that, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about it again in September. But according to some studies, children might even be less, might, uh, might transmit the virus less. We don't have the evidence for that. There's, there are some indications. Again, scientists can say, these are the, the studies that we have so far. But from that point on, it's a problem of politics because politics need to take into account a lot of other things. What, what are the uh, consequences for kids who are in the house without school for months and for those who cannot, uh, who don't have the devices to do the online school, online teaching, and so they're completely cut out of the context. Uh, all those things need to be taken into account and that's, simply another science. And okay. I mean, and it's not even my science. I can give my own perspective as a private citizen, let's say, but. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, we, we only have about four to, uh, uh, minutes and I, I wanted to ask you about herd immunity of which we don't hear a lot anymore uh, since the start of everything. But um, I am more curious about, uh, your thoughts on Europe, because uh, the last time I spoke with you it was about four weeks ago. Um, it was just after our uh, Secretary of Finance was uh, rather harsh towards uh, and blunt towards uh, the southern uh, countries in Europe. Um, I think that there has been damage done uh, indeed that week that will not be repaired so soon. How do you look at no. it now? Uh, I mean, somehow the discussion has smoothened from what I hear. Uh, also because of a very, I think that was an, that was simply because of uh, opportunity again, because uh, some, at some points, everybody realized, even the most nationalist, populist parties uh, in the different countries, I think they somehow realized that we're not going out of this alive without Europe, uh, like it or not. Um, this is too big. What is coming is too big for any of us to go out on itself. It, for Italy and Greece, but also for Germany and the Netherlands. So this somehow uh, made all the voices a little less loud and maybe a little more, uh, 
how do you say, disposable and open to discussion. But what, what I think about this pandemic is that uh, the first answer and the first reaction does matter. It really says a lot uh, on who we are. Um, and, and the first reaction of Europe was very disappointing, but not, um, I mean, I tried to change the subject from Europe uh, seen as the, I mean, uh, the people in Brussels and, and take it to us because that's, I think, what a writer should, should do, bring the things closer to each of us. And I think our reaction uh, with respect to Europe was very disappointing because we proved not to have, just not to think about Europe as something that was leaving these things altogether. So each country, all the people, they thought about their own situation. They saw things through the lenses of what was happening within their borders. And that's still what, what's happening months after. So maybe we uh, fixed, uh, for better or for worse, the, the economic situation, but we didn't do anything more. We, we never felt European in a big crisis like this. And I think that's a damage that we've already done and that each of us should really start wondering what is Europe to me? Is it, I mean, is it something existing? Is it, do I believe in it somehow? Or is it just uh, a structure hovering above and giving or not giving money or saying nasty questions and bringing out old cliches about different populations? Is, is there maybe a little tiny bit of hope? And you were stressing in the essay uh, that uh, our interconnectedness and how we are all connected and that, that this only proves all the more how together everybody on the earth is. Uh, at the same time, our reaction has had, had to be uh, closing our borders, staying within regions, in a lockdown within cities. So it's like the opposite of what we had learned that we are all together, but we are closing off for each other. But now after this closure, we are seeing that the countries that live of tourists are now begging for the moment that they can have the tourists back. The people that make, that have factories are now begging for their stuff to get imported from, uh, imported from other countries to use it in their factories. So I think maybe we are now trying, realizing a little bit more how interdependent we are. I think, uh, I hope so. And I think that many of us are, including me, including myself, are um, wishing and, and craving things that were simply for granted until four months ago. I mean, I think, I know so many Dutch people who come to Italy in the summer and they go to the same places where I go in the south of Italy and I know that they love coming here. I mean, they love the place. And somehow this is the first moment in which this is forbidden. This place has become unreachable and the opposite way around. I mean, I, I come to... Amsterdam and and The Hague and those places at least once once a year at least and suddenly those places are unreachable for me I cannot go there so uh, I hope this will bring back to us the privilege that even Europe and the possibility of traveling and the uh, the absence of borders were giving us because probably we took it for granted for uh, too long at the level of even i mean not appreciating it that much anymore yes 
Okay. Paolo, thank you very much. We all miss uh, Italians on the streets of The Hague and Amsterdam <laughs> and other uh, countries. Uh, oh, we'll be back. Great. <laughs> uh, and um, I, now I'm going to see if there are any questions uh, from the audience for you. I am not very sure how I how to do this. Um, and I hope that our... There is a Q&A thing. Yes. I touched it, and here we have it. You can also see it? Yeah, but it's better if you... I'll read them. Pick, if you choose. Um, I think... Uh, I, I, this one's a good one. Are you shocked by the lack of solidarity that the questions seems to suggest? I'm not sure if this question... Your questions? Uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> but then we, I've, I've asked so many, then I'm not sure. No, Sandor and I have, have been talking about this long before for uh, uh, for an article he wrote. So uh, we've explored quite a lot. And probably we were uh, like at this point playing around it uh, a little bit and uh, playing parts, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty. Yeah. I'm pretty sure of of his feelings about this situation. <laughs> I was only the devil's advocate. <laughs> um, we have another interesting question. How was your book received in Italy by the general public, politicians, scientists? That's an interesting question. <laughs> Do politicians ever receive books? And well, so no idea about that um, and i was uh I, I would have never done something like that in normal times uh i would have never written and published something that quickly and as a reaction that something that was still going on and actually that was just starting but uh this time i didn't really think about it. i didn't ponder the consequences of this because they simply seemed uh irrelevant uh mm -hmm. compared to the situation itself so uh, and i think that brought an honesty also in the book and in the whole publishing uh, process of the book that people, readers somehow uh, understood. I, I, I really do believe this in this in general, if readers somehow perceive the process, also the process that is behind the book. And, and this was very honest and spontaneous. And, and so the, the 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 general reception was was very good it also it also happened in a moment in which there were many many questions and a lot of uh a lot of people who were frightened and confused and i hope this brought just a tiny bit of clarity and of i mean quiet rational thinking in 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 their lives. Okay. Another interesting question. What is the role of religion now in your country during the pandemic, according to you? Well, uh, churches are about to open again. That's what we learned, I think, yesterday. Uh, this is going to happen on May 18, so next Monday, probably. Um, it's I understand it's important to very people, so to many people, so I can see why uh, churches can be a a fairly good source of risk uh, for for the epidemic. So this, uh, I hope this will be done very cautiously uh, everywhere, and. We had a very strong impact from the 
prayer that the Pope did in the empty uh, square of St. Peter. You probably saw those images. Those were very strong images, I think, uh, even for uh, non-believers, even for atheists. They were, they were simply very symbolic and with, a, with this very simple uh, sentence, what he said, we are all in the same boat. Uh, somehow the Pope grasped uh, a truth that is behind this, that many uh, people, many even people in the governments and in, the, and in Europe and abroad didn't really catch. This is a pandemic. We are in this together. It really means this. And so I think his role was very scientific in a in a strange way okay good thanks last question uh that i see before me now is oh sorry i no one more question that that i saw before but it, i'm not sure if it's easy to answer it says what exactly can we learn from the doubts of the scientists now i think we already <laughs> spoke spoken a bit about it but maybe there's something extra to say I think we should learn to be suspicious of very simple, simplified answers. You know, that's uh, it. We have a very, we have ma many examples under our eyes, but one that is very, very clear is the, uh, the all the uh, hypotheses of uh, about where this virus comes from. So, on, on the one hand we have uh, a mechanism that um, that has to do with environment and our relationship with nature and the uh, and the contacts between different species and wild species and how they're treated and these uh, the, the, this commerce of wild species so very complex world and on the other hand you have a very simple uh, answer uh, this was this escaped uh, a wrong uh, experiment in a Chinese lab so it's the fault of one or two or five people in a specific place so there is a very strong difference in the complexity of the answer and of course the lab thing is more appealing because it's simple to understand and it makes a clear enemy and a clear responsible for what is happening yes and that's probably why the reason why it's wrong <laughs> because uh, and the other reason why it's wrong is because it's not proven it's so far i mean at least up to this point it's just an accusation whether on the other hand we do have papers and uh, possible evidences which are not evidences at yet so each of us gets to choose and maybe this and this happens uh, continuously in our lives it's it goes on and on with every question so if if we just went out of this with with a more with a clearer understanding of where the line between truth and pure speculation stands for science, that would be a major uh, advance for all of us. I think we are. I think we are in this. We are learning a little bit. We have been learning the past few weeks. I think uh, so. Yeah. There are too many questions to um, uh, to answer them all, there, but I want to mention them because they are so interesting. People have really interesting contributions. Someone uh, is uh, um, thanking you for writing the book, and he thinks it's a very important document for now and the future. There is someone who emphasizes the role, uh, the voice of civil society and the human soul, and uh, 
asks if you would consider being part of a digital manifesto or website or something that would allow European writers to voice their views. Um, I guess you would consider. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I'm not very good with manifestos, but uh, I'm. I'm in any. Okay. And I, I'm talking and discussing way more than in any other moment of my life, and I'm interested in everything. Okay, I have here a, a, a very inter a nice, a nice question to, that we will uh, uh, put in as uh, as the latest uh, question. We have here a question that says. Um, uh, for example, showing Italian situations we don't see every day or hear in the news, uh, do, do they can make us aware of what is happening? I guess. Probably, but that's, that's another thing we should really think about, how uh, isolated we've become or we've always been, even in terms of uh, news and media. So um here i mean you get to see glimpses of what is happening outside you know a little more of what's going on in the united states because we're always more uh attentive to the united states a little more about england about france because it's so close about spain because it but we're so ignorant actually about what is happening outside and we're so ignorant that we don't really care but if if we were more informed we would care much more i'm pretty sure of it and right now we should all be very concerned at for instance about what is happening in africa nobody's talking about it i mean some someone is talking about it but uh, it's it's never in the head titles, uh, but this could be a major disaster there, and it might happen later than we expect. So that would really be the start for building a a higher, a bigger conscience, no, about about things. Just s starting being informed yeah. of things yet it's also sometimes shocking uh, how uh, unable we are to learn from each other and how if you if you will look at this in a study uh, in uh, 15 years uh, some student will ask the question why didn't all these countries see this coming when their neighbors had it first and why didn't they learn from each other well, that would be that will be a very embarrassing question to to answer in very fifteen years time, as you say. Yeah. Uh, I have two more questions that that are both very like very much, but are difficult probably for you. Um, one is, how does the pandemic finish? And the second one is, do you think authors nowadays can make us more empathetic? Can you start with? How does the pandemic finish? Uh, with a vaccine, uh, with a cure, or with a miracle. So it's important to decide on which one we put our money. <laughs> uh, and about writers, I mean, I think that's their role since the beginning of writing. To me, that's always been the most important role of writing, especially of writing uh, fiction. I mean, the, a book like this can be more informative somehow, but when I write fiction, what I mostly try to do is to uh, enlarge empathy as if it, I've always thought of this as, as a sort of radius that we all have around us. Our empathy can reach that distance or another distance, a bit bigger. And writing and reading for sure, to me, are the ways to expand it a little more and include new situations, new 
visions, new places. Uh, yeah. Paolo, I think as an answer to the question, do you think authors nowadays can make us more empathetic? I'll take this as a big yes. Yes, yes, Great. definitely. Paolo Giordano, thank you so much for this conversation. I would love to be the advocate of the devil here. Um, <laughs> I also thank, would like to thank all the people that asked these uh, very interesting questions. It was a very big contribution to, our, um, to this session. Uh, Paolo. And please support Border Kitchen because it's a unique festival in the world. And I can say that with a big certainty because I've been to many, but Border Kitchen is really unique in many ways. So let's all really support it so that I can come back there again. Paolo Giordano, thank you so much for these last words uh, as well. Um, we are going, the others uh, as well as going, are going to read this book by you. And um, uh, I hope that soon you will biking the streets of Rome. I hope so. Okay. Which, uh, it's a bit up and down, but I'll manage. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sander. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.